the Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church in Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends, and guests here in person and virtually. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. We honor the Gabrielino Tongva as the traditional caretakers of the land and waters of caretakers of the land and waters this campus sits on, the elders who lived here before us, the indigenous peoples today, and for the generations to come. My name is James Coombs, and I'm a member of your Board of Trustees. And today's service is led by Reverend Liz Murphy, with music by Dr. Zaneda Robles and Wells Lang. Reverend Liz Murphy is a chaplain resident at the VA Hospital in Loma Linda, California, and the, is the affiliated community minister at Orange Coast Unitarian Universalist Church, where I attended in elementary and high school. <laughs> Reverend Murphy graduated from the Claremont School of Theology with a Master's in Divinity in 2020, and originally from Pittsburgh, she lives in Los Angeles with her wife, Hillary. Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. Thank you for joining us as we continue to prioritize connection over perfection in this hybrid service, which is streamed on YouTube and is being recorded for future viewing. Seating is available in the back for those who want to make sure not to appear in the recording. And based on our guidance from our COVID safety teams, masks are required for congregants inside and optional outside. You'll find information on our website about the many ways to connect with our church community throughout the week, both in person and virtually. And I have three special announcements for this morning. First, the search committee has launched the congregational survey and a congregational survey to take a snapshot of our community and collects our hopes for a new minister who will lead Neighborhood Church into the future. You can find the link to the survey in your email and in the weekly newsletter through September 23rd. The search committee will share a summary of the survey results later on this fall. Second, Neighborhood Church Chorus and Neighborhood Bells are looking for new members. After experiencing Hiawatha's wedding feast two weeks ago, who wouldn't want to be involved with anything Dr. Robles does? Please talk with Zaneda. <laughs> Please talk with Zaneda for more information. And third, finally, we seek, are seeking additional volunteers to facilitate our whole lives classes. It is easier than ever to become an OWL teacher as online trainings are now available. We are especially seeking teachers in eighth through 12th grades. Please contact Matt Vasco if you are interested. Again, Welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service. Different from what was, sorry, uh, thought I corrected that slide. Um, it's going to be, remind us. It's going to be uh, Prelude in G minor by Elizabeth Jacquette de la, de la Guerre. So Prelude in D minor by Elizabeth de la, Jacquette de la Guerre.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the warm welcome. I'm so happy to be returning to your wonderful congregation this morning. I see so many familiar faces and a few new faces, too. For those of you who I have not yet met, my name is Liz Murphy, and I'm a UU minister based in Los Angeles. And I, as James mentioned, I currently work as a chaplain resident at the VA hospital in Loma Linda. I'm also the affiliated community minister at Orange Coast UU in Costa Mesa. So I like to get around in this <laughs> Southern California region. Um, it's always such a joy to return to UU worship and community on Sunday mornings, and it's a special treat to return to neighborhood. As I was recalling with uh, James and Randy this morning that this is where I got my start as I was beginning seminary at Claremont School of Theology. I served as your uh, membership coordinator for a time in 2017 and 18, and um, it was the warmest welcome I could have uh, hoped for in that time. And so here I am five years later, uh, now able to don the stole and to be with you all. It's a really a moment of gratitude and joy I have to be here this morning. So thank you for the welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So today in worship, we will be turning to one of the classic stories of transition, Exodus. It's a story of freedom, of fear, of an upside down world. Perhaps that sounds familiar to you. This morning, we'll re-examine this story from the Hebrew Bible, which is one of our six sacred sources, as you use, to glean wisdom, hope, and strength. These days, I think, are full of exodus moments. So how might we respond to these thresholds with commitment to community, with compassionate love, with a conviction for justice? As we consider these questions, I invite us to cross this threshold together into our sacred worship space by lighting our chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. And these words come to us from the Reverend David Breeden. Our light is the light of the sun, keeper of all we love. Our light is the light of the earth, provider of sustenance. Our light is the light of all living things, life precious like our own. Our light is the light of each of us, bound together in need and in hope. Our light is the light of the cosmos, keeper of all that we know. May it be so. Our opening hymn this morning is number 188 in your gray hymnals. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing, Come, Come, Whoever You Are. Oh, 
Giving is a spiritual practice where which, through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of contributions to a local social justice organization. This week, our gifts go to Swing Left San Gabriel Valley. Please give generously through our website, text to give, or the QR code on the or the box at the exit. If you wish to make a payment towards your pledge, please make a note in the subject line or use an envelope available at the box outside. Here to tell us about Swing Left San Gabriel Valley is Donna Jaffe, who volunteers for the organization. Donna has been a political activist most of her life, starting in high school when she volunteered to work on Bobby Kennedy's campaign and continuing through the Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, and Barack Obama presidential campaigns. Donna has been a member of Swing Left Valley since 2018 and is, has been chair since 2019. Welcome, Donna. everybody. It's my honor to be here with you this morning. Thank you for having me, Beth. I've always felt that I had a responsibility to give back to this country, which I love so much. When I retired, I searched for a political organization that had the same goals and values that I had. I found my home at Swing Left. Swing Left's mantra is from, persist, from resistance to persistence. I love those words. They mean that our fight to defend and strengthen our democracy requires a long-term commitment. We must deliver Republicans an historic wave of losses at the federal and state levels to show them that a fight against American democracy itself is not a fight they can win. Swing Left is committed to building a lasting culture of grassroots participation in winning elections for the left. How are we doing that? First, by making it as easy as possible for all of us to have the greatest impact on the elections that determine the balance of power in our country. Swing Left recognizes that as a nation, we have a long way to go to build a government and a society that serve the interests of all Americans, but also that an empowered Democratic Party is critical to moving us forward in that direction. Second, by acknowledging that winning isn't everything, but it's a start. Swing Left's specific contribution toward real positive change in our country is winning elections against Republicans. To do that, we focus our efforts on winning the swing races that deliver and keep power for all Democrats. So with that in mind, what are Swing Left's two main goals for the midterms? One, we want to defend and expand the narrow Democratic majorities in the U.S. House and Senate. Achieving this goal will continue to advance the Biden administration's agenda and what a two weeks we have had. To accomplish this goal, Swing Left has targeted 61 U.S. House races and seven U.S. Senate races. Two, we need to strengthen democracy on the state level. Winning governorships in 2022 is critical to protecting democracy in 2024 and beyond. Swing Left has targeted 29 competitive gubernatorial races with an eye toward states where Democrats can prevent unified Republican state legislatures from, from instituting laws that represent only the minority, and where we'll see critical federal elections in the coming years. Now, you might be wondering how Swing Left intends to get all this work done. Well, let me tell you. In partnership with Vote Forward, Swing Left encourages volunteers to write letters to potential voters in competitive races and to choose the state or congressional district where those voters live. So you have a choice. You can, you can write letters in Calif for California 
or you can write letters for Florida or for Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, any of the swing states. But writing letters is only part of the solution. Phone banking, text banking, and canvassing are other activities that are critical to our access. But many of us haven't participated in those activities or even know how to do them effectively or in a way that makes it fun. To help us get comfortable outside our comfort zone, Swing Left provides both training and the chance to put our big toe in the water. And we get results. During the 2020 presidential campaign, Swing Left volunteers wrote 21.5 million letters, made 9.1 million calls, and raised $26.7 million. At Swing Left, it's about doing what you're comfortable doing while making your voice heard. Remember, your voice is your power to make a difference. Please visit swingleft.org for events and activities that are right for you. I hope I've shown you why volunteering for Swing Left means so much to me, and I hope it will come to mean just as much to you. Thank you for your time this morning. none at home how can we have understanding in the land when there's none in the woman and there's none in the man how can If we cannot heal our own, and where does this peace on earth begin if not in your home? Where do we go now? Do we let the devil win? Or do we get up and fight? Surely we know how to conquer our fear, bring an end to the violence, bring an end to the tears. How And where does this peace on earth begin if not in your home? Now there's too much talk about it and too many walk without it. Tell me where is the love? Where is the God in your life? To my left, a woman abused her child, and to my right, somebody's beating their wives. Tell me, where is the love? Where is the God in your life? How can we heal the wounds of the world if we cannot heal our own? And where does this peace on earth begin 
if not in your home. How can we heal all the wounds of the world if we cannot heal our own? And where does If not in your home. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Dr. Robles. It's beautiful. Hmm. And as we continue to call the spirit of life into being this morning, I invite us to move into a time of meditation and prayer. I invite you to find a comfortable seat in your chair. For those of you connecting from home, Find a seat on your couch or at your table and take a moment to pause. For everyone in this space, both here and online, I invite you to put your hands at your side or on your lap and to let your eyelids slowly flutter to a close. Let's take a deep breath in and out together. We will hear some meditative words from the Reverend Monica Jacobson Tennyson. I invite you to ponder your responses to these open questions as you allow yourself to relax into this moment. What is it that calls you here? that calls you onward, that calls you inward, that leads you homeward. What is it that gives you the power to make that change, to ask that question, to take that journey? What is it that says you have done well, that asks you to learn more, that brings you to stillness, that holds you up in hard times? Perhaps it is relationship, the beating heart of our faith, It begins when we share this hour, our truths, this air, our hearts. Let us dwell in these questions now for a few more moments in this sacred silence. Let us close our meditation this morning in prayer. Transcendent Spirit, God of our understanding, we reside in a time of transition, of threshold. We are at the door of this exodus moment in our lives. May this community of people be surrounded in love, 
surrounded and held in comforting presence, in abundant health, and in the conviction toward justice. May this be a time of gratitude for the connections we share with one another in this moment, a time of thanks for the beloved community that blossoms in this sanctuary, both in this physical room and within the homes of all of us connecting at home each Sunday morning. May this blossom grow even more loving kindness, patience, and strength into our world. May we affirm the great good in our lives and work to build more of it together in the places where it does not yet reside, today and every day. May it be so, blessed be, and amen. Our meditative hymn is number 1009 in your teal hymnal, right from your seats with a posture conducive to great support and optimal breathing and flow. Let us sing together meditation on breathing. We'll sing it four times. reading this morning comes from the late theologian and mystic John O'Donohue from his book, To Bless the Space Between Us. It speaks to the power and presence of threshold moments in our lives. He writes, a threshold is not a simple boundary. It is a frontier that divides two different territories, rhythms, and atmospheres. Indeed, it is a lovely testimony to the fullness and integrity of an experience or a stage of life that it intensifies towards the end into a real frontier that cannot be crossed without the heart being passionately engaged and woken up. At this threshold, a great complexity of emotion comes alive, confusion, fear, excitement, sadness, hope. This is one reason why such vital crossings were always clothed in ritual. It is wise in your own life to be able to recognize and to acknowledge your key thresholds, to take your time, to feel all the varieties of presence that accrue here, to listen inwards with complete attention until you hear that inner voice calling you forward. The time has come to cross. To acknowledge and cross a new threshold is always a challenge. It demands courage and also a sense of trust in whatever is emerging. 
This becomes essential when a threshold opens suddenly in front of you, one for which you had no preparation. It could be illness or suffering or loss. Because we are so engaged with the world, we usually forget how fragile life can be and how vulnerable we are. It takes only a couple of seconds for a life to change irreversibly. Suddenly you stand on completely strange ground and a new course of life has to be embraced. Especially at such times, we desperately need blessing and protection. You look back at the life you have lived up to a few hours before and it suddenly seems so far away. Each life is a mystery that is never finally available to the mind's lights or questions. That we are here is a huge affirmation. Somehow life needed us and wanted us to be. To sense and trust this primeval acceptance can open a vast spring of trust within our hearts. It can free us into a natural courage that casts out fear and opens up our lives to become voyages of discovery, creativity, and compassion. Whatever comes, the great sacrament of life will remain faithful to us, blessing us always with visible signs of invisible grace. We merely need to trust. The church, in times like these that I often turn to story, in times of trouble, in times of worry, in times of transition, I search for the narratives that give me a sense of context, a sense of connection, a sense that we're not alone. Perhaps you do this too. And with so much uncertainty in all of our lives, Stories have the power to ground us in the now, providing a sense of hope. Religion, spirituality, covenantal community, what are they without story? They bind us together as people from the past to our present and into the future. And one story that I have often been turning to in these times is that of Exodus. And I would hazard a guess that many of you have some sense of this story from the Hebrew Bible, which is, as I mentioned, one of our six sacred sources as Unitarian Universalists. It's been made into movies, cartoons, children books, action figures, you name it. And The Prince of Egypt is one of mine and my wife's top five movies at home, so it's a well-loved story in my household. But still, for those of you who may need a refresher, let's go over the basics. Moses, who comes from a very privileged upbringing as the son of the Egyptian pharaoh, learns as a young adult that he is adopted. His birth parents are not Egyptian, but Hebrew, the community of people who have been forced into slavery and servitude under his adoptive father, the pharaoh. Needless to say, this revelation rocks Moses' world. His identity is flipped on its head and he eventually becomes the rebel leader of the Hebrew people who are miraculously able to flee generations of slavery in Egypt. In the scripture, God promises Moses and his people an end to their suffering and a rescue to a quote, good and spacious land flowing with milk and honey. And in one of the most awe-inspiring moments of the Exodus story, Moses is able to part the Red Sea with the divine help of God, enabling his people to leave the land, they've, the only land that they've ever known, a land that has been the site of their confinement and oppression for something better, for something new, for something utterly unknown to them. And they make it. They make it. Moses and his siblings, Aaron and Miriam, they lead their people in a celebration like they've never seen before. There's music and dancing and celebration, and it's an incredible story of family, of freedom, 
of total faith. And this is often the place we stop with this story. Victory, freedom, hallelujah. What more could you ask for, really? And I think most people stop here because what comes next for this group of people is not the promised milk and honey. What comes next are the inconvenient realities, the times of uncertainty and anguish, the seasons of plague and death. The really hard stuff is what comes next. We do want to believe it's a happy ending right there. But there is indeed more to this ancient story. I think it's this next threshold, this exodus after the exodus that has so captured my imagination these last few months and truly years. Because I think we're here, church. I think we are in that period of wandering, of searching, of dealing with great loss. It's hard to know what to hold on to, what to believe. Things were hard, really hard. And then they started to get better. But we are still not free from wandering in this wilderness. But looking to our story, the thing that gives me heart is that this community of people, now in this liminal space after their exodus from Egypt and before settling into their new home, they act just like us. They act just like I think most of us would in this situation. Ooh, they're angry, they are frustrated, and they are so scared. They are mad at a God that they think hasn't fulfilled on the promise of a new home. They are frustrated with their leader, Moses, for keeping his conversations with God tight-lipped. And they're scared for their families that they will not survive. They are wandering without clarity about the path forward. Where will they be safe? Where can they build community together? Where is home? I imagine there are some echoes of familiarity in there for many of us here too. And it's fascinating to watch this boil over in our story with God at one point in the scriptures calling them a bunch of quote, stiff necked people, yikes. But they've had enough wandering. They are utterly uninterested in waiting for Moses to give them updated instruction. So they lash out, creating a golden calf, something tangible that they can put their faith and their hope in. It's a visible reminder, something that feels more certain. But then they're dealt a blow, suffering a destructive plague that takes the lives of many. And talk about highs and lows for them, right? I mean, this has been quite the pendulum sp swing for Moses and the Hebrew people. And it's in this swing, I think we find a bit of solace a bit of strength, I think we find us here, now. Are we not, at least in some small way, in this wandering wilderness? This time we are in seems to me to be an exodus moment of major proportions. This story holds so many lessons, but one is this. We all face exodus moments in our lives, thresholds that usher us into a new place a new time, and a new way of being. And Moses and his people teach us that these moments are messy, they are complicated, and they sometimes bring pain. We don't always understand why we've come to the doorstep of change. And yet here we are, trying to find the people and the places that give us a sense of belonging, trying to lean on the beliefs and the values that have carried us through before, trying to take another step, even though we are dog tired or sick with fear. Moses and the Hebrew people began an epic journey in their Exodus moment. Their caravan led to the creation of a covenant with God, a promise, an oath to one another and to the flourishing of their community. And slowly but surely, they settled into their new reality they lived into this covenant, committing to one another and to making difficult decisions as community. 
And in time, they did make it to a place that they would call home, promised all those years ago. Perhaps we too are headed toward a renewed covenant ourselves. This Exodus moment we find ourselves in now is an opportunity for us to reflect on what and to whom do we promise our hearts, our efforts, our love. Because those tethers, those things, they are the stuff of life. And we Unitarian Universalists are a covenantal people. And it's a word, covenant, that we throw around a lot. But what does it mean when we say it? Covenant is a binding of people together, sealed and held in love by the transcendent. It's a commitment to one another in the ups and downs of life, through transgression and forgiveness, through conflict and unity. Covenant represents our greatest ideal as a community of people willing to support, to sacrifice, and to flourish with and for one another. Covenant is a process rather than an endpoint. It's as fluid as each of our human lives, but it's also, as ri it's also rigid in requiring everyone's commitment and accountability. It calls us to commit to collectivism over and against a toxic individualism. It's distinct from a community agreement in that it includes an element of the transcendent. For some, that element is called God. For others, it's the spirit of life or the love that holds us all. And for others still, it's an appreciation for something bigger than any one individual human being. Covenant is perhaps best described by Rumi, the ancient Sufi mystic who always seems to have the right words and those words we sang just earlier this morning. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you have broken your vows a thousand times, come, yet again, come. I think it's a beautiful recognition of the ways we human beings often don't live up to our virtuous ideals we set out for ourselves. Because covenant is not about binaries, black or white, yes or no, in or out. It's about black and white and about gray too. It's about yes and. It's a radical commitment to our realities of life, to the ways we are indeed human. Commitment to the gray, to the yes and. But of course, that commitment doesn't mean you can do or say whatever you like in community. There are bounds to any covenant. This is not a concept that makes space for repeated and extraordinary harm. But what it does do is makes room for missteps and mistakes, and it also calls us to repair them, not to run away from them or forget that they happened. Harming one another happens, conflict happens. And within the bounds of covenant, we make space and support a process of restoration and repair. And I think in times like these, these threshold moments, we are able to reaffirm and rewrite the script of what community means, what it means to love ourselves and to love our neighbors. It's the returning to commit to the process that's the hard part. I said covenant represents our greatest ideals because we don't always have the humility to follow through with all that it means to be in community. It isn't comfortable to own up to mistakes. It doesn't feel good to do the work of restoration and repair. But it's a necessary piece of all that community has to offer. And Moses and the Hebrew people had to learn these lessons as they faced their threshold moment, making plenty of mistakes along the way but according to scripture, also building a community that blossomed so much love, beauty, and justice too. So as we stand at our own doorstep of change, thinking about how we might want to rewrite the script of community, of the world around us, I'll ask us again, what and to whom do we promise our hearts, our efforts, and our love? The answers to this question, I think, will help ease our path out of the wandering wilderness we found ourselves in. 
Church, so much of what we've known, the way we've lived our lives has changed. How might this Exodus moment be an invitation to us to renew our commitments to communal healing, to justice in moments big and small, to imagining community in ways that are more inspiring, liberative, and loving than we've ever seen before? Because these Exodus moments, they only come every so often. So may we ground ourselves in this time, knowing that we are not alone, that many have come through these thresholds before us. May we connect more deeply with our inner voice of strength and wisdom. May we branch out in love and compassion and in grace to all those around us who are seeking balance and peace in this time. May this Exodus moment be a renewal of our covenant with one another and with the love that holds us all. May it be so, blessed be, and amen. Our closing hymn is number 163 in your gray hymnal. Will you please rise in body or in spirit and join me in singing For the Earth Forever Turning, number 163. As we move into our benediction, I want to first extend my gratitude to James, Zaneda, and Wells, and everyone else who made today's worship service happen and so beautifully. And of course, thank you, all of you at Neighborhood Church, both here in the sanctuary and at home, for welcoming me back into your beautiful worship space this morning. I'm so glad to have spent my Sunday with you. Church, may we meet this Exodus moment with a heart of courage. May this be a time of grounding within ourselves and within our congregational community of beloved souls. For we never walk this path of transition alone. May you go in peace. Blessed be and amen. <laughs>